I'm talking a little bit out of left field, but the biodiversity side of uh, our region is really starting to link in with what GDC and some of the other groups around the, the district are looking at for the future. Um, an example of that is the work uh, that my company EcoWorks has been involved with uh, on Tikuri or Young Nick's Head for the last 10 years where we've, we've restored uh, Tuatara and um, after 84 years we've brought the petrels, the seabirds back, the mutton birds back onto uh, Young Nick's Head. Um, We've now, uh, with, the, with Tom Stone and his team on, on Nick's Head, we've planted over six, 600,000 native trees. So, um, so we've, we've got a real story which has evolved there on, on Te Kuri. I'm linking with Ngai Tamanu Hedi as well, and them being involved with the translocation process of Tuatara from Cook Strait, working with Ngāti Kuata back to, to Tairawhiti. And so it's created this, this huge story. So, I've talked to John and Amy Griffin about it. I don't really un know whether they understand how big um, this legacy is that they've created for our region. But so that's one small example, and then it links in beautifully with 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 Mayor Ming's uh, vision of walkways through into Te Whiro Whiro, working with Tamanu Hiri, creating uh, wildlife zones on the wetland there for terns and dotterel and that sort of thing, and then expanding into tourism. So there's huge potential. Another example in our region is uh, the Longbush Trust, which I've, I've been involved with, um, working with Dayman and Jeremy Salmon for the last 10 or 12 years. And um, we've, we're in the process of building a visitor centre at on Riverside Road at the Reserve, and that'll be a hub for school groups to come and learn about conservation education. But that's kind of linked into this 2019 Sister Centennial celebration as well because because Dame Anne's gone to England and talked to people at Kew Gardens and others and organised to bring back seed material which was originally collected by Joseph Banks here in 1769. So there's this huge story that's that's evolving in our region, which makes us incredibly unique, um, not only from a biodiversity angle but also uh, the people angle and and our history. So um, tonight I wanted to just present a very quick overview um, over the next hour or so about <laughs> once I start to shut me up um, about what, what we're doing um, and it's it's really exciting tonight to see uh, people that I'm involved heavily with like Uncle Star there he's one of our trustees on a Kiwi recovery project he's our Komatua at at Motu so. Um, He's been involved with Kiwi Recovery for a long time as well. And, um, and, and uh, Graham and Shannon down the back there, we're, we're working together to restore uh, Titarangi as well, which is another story which is starting to really evolve um, also. So um, we've got this, I'll just quickly go through this. We've got a really unique um, biodiversity history. We've got a highly modifi modified region, unfortunately. We've lost almost um, all of our indigenous forest cover and with that we lost uh, a lot of our species. If you talk to some of the older people in the region they talk about harvesting mutton birds at Waihiriri and, and uh, Te Kuri back in the 1930s with their grandparents. Um, so we're starting to work with, with some of the iwi and asking the oldies in the, in the groups from the iwi how did you live as a child? What was important to you? What were the resources available? And trying to restore those resources where we can. Um, of course, we had uh, Kiwi and, and Tuatara were common, a lot of fossil bones of Tuatara from Wainui um, up onto the coast. So that's been a real story about bringing them back to Tikuri, and hopefully from there they'll move into other reserves in the region as well. And we're now working with Victoria <laughs> University to try and take Tuatara to. To, to Motu as well, which uh, links in with a cycle trail. So, so there's this um, real story evolving here. Um, we had a, a seabird capital of the world, not particularly Gisborne, but New Zealand. We had this huge um, seabird fauna coming onto the, our shores every night, bringing many kilos of guano, it's a nice word for bird poo, and fertilising our forests and, um, and supporting our ecosystem. And uh, our last seabirds died out in about the 1930s from, mm -hmm. from Young Nick's Head and, um, and Waihiriri were the last records around that time. But of course Titirangi, Titi is, is mutton bird or seabird, so 
there must have been large colonies of seabird on, on uh, Kaiti Hill or Titirangi um, many years ago as well. And of course we had um, the moa, which um, men were saying it might be a challenge to bring back, um, but I'm sure with Jurassic Park technology we can work on that. And um, we had uh, several species of moa, these are some of the bones we've found uh, at Tiniroto. Um, the largest um, moa in, in the North Island we had here, which stood three and a half metres tall. But, um, we had uh, an amazing reptile fauna, so tuatara were common. Uh, on the, right from the coast to the inland, they were also found in places like inland Otago, so they're under snow half the year. So we have all of these species here in Gisborne. Um, and of course uh, the kiwi, this is the, the brown kiwi. But then um, 9th of October uh, 1769, um, the ship sailed round into Poverty Bay and, um, and it was probably about that time the first rats arrived, which um, were Norway and ship rats, and uh, just had a huge impact on our biodiversity. And um, The Norway rat, uh, which is that guy there, grows up to half a kilo and is quite a carnivorous rat, so they had a huge impact on our biodiversity. So, so we lost many of our species a long time ago. So we really transformed our region. Uh, we effectively might as well be on Mars. We, um, we introduced the predators, we took away a lot of the endemic species uh, that had evolved here for millions of years. Walter from Otago University, who did the archaeology dig at um, <coughs> Tolaga Bay, um, he estimates the moa are extinct about, about six weeks after people arrived. So um, they, they disappear from the archaeological midden layer six weeks after people arrived in, in Cook's Cove. So, so we had a huge impact on our, on our biodiversity. But luckily, uh, we are getting to the stage where we're starting to learn how to restore it. We, we know um, we, can, we can manage and control the predators pretty well. We've still got a long way to go, but we'll, we've learned a fair bit about it. Um, we know which uh, tree species to plant, for example, eco-sourcing um, trees from the same ecological district. We're getting pretty good at translocating wildlife. We can move mutton birds around the country. Um, though it's pretty slow work trying to get them to re-establish, but we're, we're uh, establishing some really good techniques which we're exporting over to other countries. We're working in Hawaii and Fiji um, doing that sort of work. And so we're starting to learn how to restore ecosystem process and manage the predators. And this, this shot here is um, a young that's head. This is back in 2003, 4, um, before we built the predator-proof fence. And this is a photo from last year, so um, within that area we've established um, a whole range of seabird species and, and reptiles and, um, just by keeping out the, the mice and the, the rats and the stoats and cats. So we've tried some pretty novel techniques which we really over time want to start using at other sites like Makaruri Headland and it all depends on getting sponsorship and, and funding of course. But um, we, we can do novel things like this. We, um, on Young Nick's head years ago, I said to John Griffin, why don't we just try and put some speakers on the headland and see if we can um, convince the mutton birds there's actually an active colony there and see if we can re-establish them. And they, they fell for it hook, line and sinker and the birds arrived six months later and, and now we have over 200 mutton birds visiting back on Young Nick's head. Um, we've got birds sitting in burrows at the moment on eggs. Um, so that was, that was successful and, and now we're, we're using this technique, we're teaching the, um, the US biologist how to do it in Hawaii and, and doing the same thing in Fiji. Um, so these are all the, the, uh, the seabirds, the petrels and the, um, the shearwaters which have come back to, um, to young its head. Um, this is the Iron <coughs> shearwater which doesn't nest on mainland New Zealand any longer except for young its head. Um, the fairy prine, which doesn't nest anywhere around here except for young its head. It's only found uh, in Cook Strait and very uh, northland, but for some reason they've come to Gisborne, so it's obviously Gisborne's a central hub of the universe. Um, and the southern mutton bird, which is uh, um, the one they harvest and sell in the buckets. So that, that guy's decided to come to young its head as well. And the grey-faced petrel. And we've recently brought back the gannet as well. So um, 
just by using fiberglass decoys made in the United States and pretending they were sitting on real nests. And we've used sound again and we've brought them back in and they, they, they breed successfully. And this year they fledged 123 chicks. So. And the fishermen tell me the fishing's improved off the, off the point as well. So it must be all the, the guano being deposited into the, into the marine ecosystem, I'm not sure. So the Tuatara, of course, was a, a fairly long-term project. It took 10 years to get the consultation done and the permits and everything. And uh, finally they, they arrived. So on Young Nick's head, we have 62 Tuatara there um, at the moment. Uh, it's still fairly cold, so they're pretty much hibernating. But again, that has been a huge story, um, bringing, bringing them back and working with, with iwi and, and the different players involved and actually reconnecting um, Naitamana Hiri with Naitahu um, from the South Island, which uh, Richard and Jody and team tell me is a, there's, a, there's a connection that goes way back um, historically there. So it's, it's, it's a lot more than just about um, biodiversity or a species, it's a, it's a lot about the people and how that links into the story. So that's been a fantastic um, project. So <clears throat> about five years ago, um, Anne Salmon and I, we, we've been trying to raise money for these biodiversity projects for you know 12 years and it's quite difficult, it's very competitive and every time you get thirty or forty thousand um, dollars that's great, you can employ a trapper or you can do a bit of work but 12 months later it's pretty much gone, you know, if you're, it's a pretty tight budget. So we're trying to work out ways where we could really bring some serious money into the region and we came up with the idea of the bioregions concept and um, me and Judy and, and the team have really um, taken this on board and, and are very interested in this idea as well. And um, the Tihar Trust, which is organising the, the 250th um, Sister Centennial, that's right, um, they've, they've taken it on as the body which, which will drive this bioregions um, concept and there's some, some great people involved on that, that board, some real smart thinkers. And the idea behind the bioregions concept is, is it's a transformational project. So we try and link a number of key biodiversity restoration projects together within our region so that we can then actually source some significant funding, as in the millions of dollars, to do some major restoration work. And at the moment, the, the thinking is that we have five, maybe six key projects, and these all link together. So we're working with DOC um, recovery group people and species specialists to, to meet the national objectives that they want to meet. But it saves us a lot of money by being able to share species, for example, um, at um, Longbush, we moved a lot of the tree wetters from Longbush to Young Nick's Head. So we, we were restoring a whole forest ecosystem from, from pasture with Aberdeen Angus cattle grazing in it to Tuatara habitat. So we had to restore the whole thing from the invertebrates up. So, so that was one example. Um, we've also moved North Island robins from uh, Matawai to, to Longbush. So we want to start um, building on that, um, rebuilding the biodiversity for our region, but also um, linking the people in, which is extremely important. Because you can't beat local passion. So some of the projects um, I've talked about um, Nick's head already. Um, Longbush, as I mentioned, this is a really exciting project and, and heavily involved in the bioregions concept. And um, also, the idea behind Longbush is that we not only provide an educational resource, but potentially a tourism resource for visitors. And um, it's seven minutes drive from Gisborne City to Longbush Reserve on Riverside Road. So, so we're, we're planning to restore a number of species so we can bring these wealthy Germans, whoever, off the cruise ships to Longbush, and they spend a bucket load of money on the way there and back and into town and have a great day. Um, but we, we're then able to pour all that money back into biodiversity conservation. Same with the Motu Valley, um, there's a couple of people up towards Matawai who are interested in um, kind of doing this venison farm type tour uh, with tourists to, to Gisborne and, and this project again links in with the cycle trails that we were talking about earlier on. 
So um, we're also building a visitor centre here and, and what we want to do is build a Kiwi viewing experience. So, so within the predator-proof closure at Motu, we'll have four or five Kiwi chicks at a time. And uh, the visitor centre will actually, there'll be a viewing tunnel goes under the fence so that um, at night you can go in and you can see the Kiwi chicks feeding, you can actually train them to feed at one place. And during the day, school kids can go in there and there'll be uh, live video feed from the Kiwi burrows, so they'll see the Kiwi chicks in the burrows and uh, really get a hands-on experience up there at Motu, which links in with the Cycle Trails um, project as well. Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So, so the Bioregions uh, project, as I say, it's not just about restoring the biodiversity, but it's about restoring that connection with the land, and, and we've lost a lot of that. Um, when you talk to um, people and they fly over at Gisborne and they fly into Auckland, they look down on the forest and it looks fantastic and it's beautiful and green, but underneath there's, there's a huge loss of biodiversity and we've got stoats, ferrets, weasels, deer, pigs, goats, all chomping away underneath 24-7. Uh, so um, so it's, a, it's a lot about restoring um, that connection, that knowledge um, for both iwi and uh, everyone else. It's really important that we have that um, restored. Um, and that comes into that um, bringing back the car or repairing that knowledge gap, gap that we have and ensuring that we have local people involved in the, um, the biodiversity um, recovery projects. And it, it all links in, it, uh, it's fascinated here what you're talking about planting trees. Um, working with uh, Graham Smale and Shannon and the, and the team, we, we've been working on Kaiti Hill for a number of years and this year we've replanted 16,000 native trees on Kaiti and Makarori. So that should be 16,000 less crimes. <laughs> so, um, so it's absolutely right. If, if you, have a, if you have, have a nice, clean, healthy, good looking environment, you have a better lifestyle. Um, you, you produce a better primary product which is higher value in your market. Um, you get paid more as an employee. Um, Mum doesn't go and have to work as a cleaner at $13 an hour until midnight. Um, so you end up restoring the whole family unit. So, so restoring biodiversity in our environment, clean waterways, um, a green environment actually helps our families and our economy in, in our region. Um, and you only have to look at a few examples of that, um, like Icebreaker, for example, or Swazi clothing. Overseas people love that New Zealand story, that organic New Zealand story. And, and if you talk to guys like um, John Thorpe, who wants to sell, well the Chinese people want to buy thousands more bottles of wine than he can possibly produce in one year, because they realise that we've got this beautiful clean green water coming from Gisborne. So if we can keep producing that, we end up producing a high quality commodity and product from our region. Everyone gets paid more. We've happy families. It's real simple. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's about it from me. Um, thanks very much. And any questions? The, the garden design actually replicates the botanical values that we we have had historically here in the region, and actually to the point where on the second day that Cook and Solon uh, banks were here, they apparently walked around the wetland towards. Um, the airport and collected a number of plants and we've actually got the list and the pressings um, of those plants they collected so so the gardens will tell that story um, and then also linking in with the wildlife as well and the people um, are really you know a big part of our story in Gisborne is, uh, is about our people so um, you know from Steve um, you just said you've planted 16 odd thousand um, trees on Kaiti Hill and um, we know that the, uh, the hill is infested with uh, predators. Um, would you <coughs> suggest that the next stage before any other developments happen on the, on the hill would be to eradicate um, all the predators on there? Or um, can you do different stages with them there? Quite difficult to do the pest control in, in a public area like that, just with the amount of you know, use we're getting. Um, so, the, we're not having really much any impact on the on the plants themselves. There's a few possums. There's not not a huge density of possums. Um, there was a goat, but I think that's gone, um, and a couple of horses. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. That's right, and a penguin colony as well. So, yeah, we have talked about it, and that's definitely where we'd like to head in the long term is to do that full restoration with the, the species as well as the, the forest um, ecology. Yeah, for sure. Is Tuamotu Island not an option? I'll have to talk to me uh, about that. I'm not too sure. Uh, we've been approached about restoring Tuamotu. Um, the issue is who owns it and what purposes it has. So originally it was taken by the port or by council for port purposes. So there's a process we would have to go through to decide we're now doing something else with it. So uh, it, it's not as straightforward as just replanting, but ultimately that could happen. 